uh, introduction. Okay, I'm gonna start sharing the screen and then uh, here we go. Okay, is it working for everyone? It is, you're not in slideshow mode yet. There you are, now you are. Now I'm good, right? You see the full yes. screen? Okay. Perfect. Okay, so uh, yeah, welcome everyone. Um, today I'm gonna talk to you about, well, travel, which is a bit different from what I usually, usually talk about, uh, which are mostly ID courses I've been giving for uh, Rocky Point. Um, but as Anne announced it pretty well, is that I am, uh, well, more and more a full-time tour guide at this point. Um, and that job brings me to many places in the world with the purpose of birding. Um, quite often, as soon as a tour is done and the photos are processed, uh, they end up on eBird and then that's it. That's kind of the end of it. So I figured it would be a good idea to bundle a bunch of photos from one particular trip uh, that I did last fall and that I am about to do again uh, in eight days from now, it seems like. Um, and uh, just to tell you a little bit about a fairly unknown country in especially North America, um, uh, Oman, which has quite some potential or, yeah, it's just an amazing place for birding. Um, but given that in the tourism industry, uh, being in the tourism industry, I noticed that the, the, the most popular places for North Americans to travel to is, are quite often Central or South America um, or Europe. Uh, I just figured that a somewhat more unknown country like Oman deserved a place um, in here as well, maybe to pique your interest or to spark some ideas of, of traveling there in the future. Um, next one. Okay, so who am I? Um, well, Anne announced it pretty well. I'm, my name is Joachim Bertrands. Uh, I'm a Belgian living in Canada. So I'm origin I, or I grew up in Europe uh, and I've been a lifelong naturalist with a strong focus on birds. Uh, I am trying to be a full-time tour guide. Um, and I, I am, so I am a tour guide by choice, a biologist by training. Um, I, yes, I do like to be abroad for work uh, and, and, and coming home and doing office work at home in the, to fill in the gaps in between. Uh, and as many of you might know, I am obsessed with all things birding. Um, and today I hope to share my experiences and hopefully inspire you. Um, a link that I might share a few more times throughout this presentation is my link tree, which you can find beneath here is www.linktr.ee slash Joachim Bertrands, my full name. There you find some information on my social media or uh, the tours that I'm leading. Um, yeah, so Oman. Um, yeah, just for starters, uh, one could wonder why Oman? Um, well, first of all, as a birder, I grew up in Western Europe, and so um, quite often the tantalizing locations from a European or Western polyarctic point of view are the Middle East and North Africa, not only because of the remoteness and the special birds, but also because it can be quite challenging to travel there, uh, in some areas at least. Oman falls just outside of that boundary as in Europe is quite popular. It's like the ABA region here, but there it's called the West of Polyarctic. So the Oman lies just outside of it, but has this shares many species with that zone uh, together with more influences from Asia as well as Africa. So just a few very dry facts on Oman. Uh, Oman is a sultanate, so there's a sultan in charge, um, and it's the oldest continuously independent state in the Arab world. The Brits have had quite some influence there in the past. However, uh, for very long, it's been, it's been an independent country by itself. It's considered a high-income country with an economy that's ma mainly based on oil, tourism, but also fishing trade. And especially that last part is quite reflected into the people as well. Um, it's also ranked highest on the World Peacefulness Index of all Arab countries uh, or all countries in the Middle East. Um, 
Oman is located at the very northeastern tip of the, what's called the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and so um, it's often considered the, the easiest country to travel uh, in that area. Um, but not only from a political or bureaucratic point of view, it's quite interesting. Um, if you look at many, uh, or like the eco zone that many birds, that sh where many bird species are shared, you see that Oman lies in what is kind of called the Saharan Arabian eco zone. And uh, that's just a biological area where that shares many similar species. And if you have a country that's located roughly in the, in the central area, which Oman more or less is, uh, you can kind of uh, see species from, yeah, it gives you a very good sample of that whole, uh, of that whole eco zone. And it has to be said, unfortunately, as you can see from many other countries in that zone, uh, many of these countries are currently off limits for travel due to many different uh, political uh, reasons that I'm not going to go into. Um, however, uh, it is um, from a traveler's point of view, uh, it is uh, interesting that at least Oman is quite uh, quite well uh, travelable uh, without really any difficult visa application or or dangerous areas or it's just an overall very safe, easy country. Now, the Omani people, who are the Omani people, actually? Well, if you look at the demographics, uh, then Omani people consider themselves mainly uh, Arabic, uh, quite often with a, a tribal background. Um, and so especially in the past, the nomadic uh, as well as the trade nature of, of uh, small settlements of people uh, have made it are, well, and the fact that their main economy was uh, fishing trade or trade with uh, with uh, travelers or, or, or traders from the east as well as from the south, so from Persia and farther east as well as from the Horn of Africa, that has made them into a very diverse uh, group of people um, that, uh, yeah, that you can definitely notice the influences from, from the different continents there. Uh, but also it makes Omani people quite uh, open and um, tolerant towards uh, towards other people um, and towards other cultures and also religions. Um, because of course that 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 nature of 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 trading and and just having to be very uh, open-minded towards other other cultures. Uh, here are some of the uh, younger people that I. Uh, Easily got onto the birds. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to see a few of these, uh, especially the younger guys again uh, this year uh, after they got really into into the into the birding there last year. Um, so yes, this that, that's about the people. However, another important um, um, population of uh, Oman are the Bengali uh, workers that make up for almost one third of the population. Um, so quite often when you're traveling, you, uh, you're actually quite often eating South Asian food, um, and not so much traditional Arabic food, um, because, uh, the immigrant workers are very well represented, uh, on the streets and in the shops. Um, and again, here, um, very, uh, open-minded people that are very, um, easy to communicate with because many people also speak uh, speak at least some sort of English. And then of course, there's a, a, a category of, of uh, expats that, uh, that work uh, in, in Oman. Um, I have to say that I have not, or I have yet to meet an Omani birder, although I have heard there are some Omani birders around, but I have to say that it is one of the first countries I've ever traveled to where I did not run into a, a local birder uh, right away. So yes, the religion, uh, predominantly Islam, but there's also um, a, a smaller group of uh, uh, people practicing Hinduism as well as Christianity and others. Okay, so that brings us to the habitats. Um, if you think of Oman, a country in Arabia, the first habitat that probably comes to mind is desert. Um, however, it's far from only that. If you look at the map, you see that Oman has quite some high uh, altitudinal differences. 
um, with some really uh, high mountains in the north, the famous uh, Al Hajar Mountains. Um, and then in the far south, there is another mountain slash plateau range. Uh, in between these areas, uh, there, it's fairly a fairly low low landscape. Um, however, uh, thanks to the different uh, weather patterns, especially in the south, you get a variety of, of habitats. Um, so I've kind of divided these into some of the most common ones. For example, of course, dry and sandy desert habitat is one that we really, um, yeah, that you will really run into when you're in, in Oman. Um, especially in the north, you have these very steep and dry Al Hajar mountains. Um, the country also has quite a few intact mangroves, although mangroves in the Arabic world are under immense threat, especially of development, because they always uh, grow exactly where developers want to build resorts and stuff like that. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a dwindling dwindling habitat for sure. Um, Oman is also known for its lagoons, kind of brackish lagoons, which are locally called quars. Um, they are quite interesting because in a country with so little water available, uh, these little freshwater lagoons um, or well, brackish water lagoons really attract a lot of birds and migrants. And so they're quite popular among visiting birders to search for, uh, you know, let's say washed up uh, vagrants from Far East or even Africa. Of course, being a country that's flanked by the ocean, beaches and shores are a very common habitat as well. And then maybe what I personally find the most interesting one in the far south are the Afro-tropical forests uh, in the famous Dofar mountain range. Um, very similar to the Ethiopian plateaus um, and really sharing some species with that. And then of course there's the ocean. Um, very important. There's some really good seabirding there as well. Uh, which you wouldn't right away expect, but um, yeah, really, really good, great stuff. So yeah, the desert, of course, deserts come in many forms and shapes, um, but it quite often it looks kind of like this, a bit of an irregular pattern uh, where you're scoping and looking for mainly larks uh, or wheat ears, such as this desert wheat ear, a very common bird that you can find almost anywhere really. Um, but quite a quite a good looking one, and um, um, always uh, always accompanying you. Of course, larks are a bit more difficult to come uh, to come by, but uh, uh, this greater hoopoe lark uh, is always a great species to encounter. They have very strange white patterned wings that really light up whenever they're flying. Another more striking lark is the black crowned sparrow lark. That's a species that's quite widespread in the Sahara all the way to northern India. Uh, quite often gives away itself by its song flight and has a very weird black body and a white ear spot. And then every once in a while, when you're in the desert, you run into a place like this, which is a kind of a natural oasis. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the water is gushing out somewhere, but quite often it just means that there is a, a bit of a more vegetated uh, location, uh, quite often a bit more clumped together acacias or some palm trees, and then some of the smaller stuff as well. Now, if you bird these places, uh, especially early morning is good uh, because migrant birds will be still active uh, before they start hunkering down for the for the uh, for the heat of the day. Um, but of course, a very um, typical phenomenon in the desert in the early morning are the sand grouse uh, flying over, uh, coming to drink. Quite often uh, they know a place where there's a leaky water pipe or a small uh, spring that just gives just enough water for them to soak their uh, chest feathers in. And uh, th that way they um, transport water sometimes kilometers away to where the nest is. And these are spotted sand grouse, but up to four different species can be easily found uh, in these desert habitats in Oman. And another famous bird is the gray hypocoleus, uh, a relative of the wax wings, but in the, placed in its different, in its own family. Um, it's a 
species that mainly breeds in Iraq and Iran and winters um, in these kind of um, oases in the, on the Ar Arabian Peninsula. It's always a bit of a challenge to find them because they can be really sneaky, but um, we lucked out with one early bird at last year. And then, of course, at night, the deserts are, yeah, they really come to life. Um, species like the desert, uh, like the Egyptian nightjar uh, can be found in some areas. Um, but the same goes for small owls, such as uh, this little owl here. And of course, many other forms of wildlife uh, you can encounter during the night. There is this gecko that I only know the Latin name of. Um, but it's a quite a common species in in uh, in deserts at night. Um, same goes for foxes, different uh, species of fox. Um, there is even a, a species of um, what's it called again? One of the mustelids uh, that you can find there. So spotlighting at night in the desert is always a, a fun idea. Of course, during the middle of the day, um, you find some more typical. Uh, animals. Of course, nowadays it's pretty hard to come by any really wild dromedary camels, um, but you can still see many of these half wild or feral uh, populations uh, roaming the desert. And then in some parts of Oman, although this photo I took on the way back in the UAE, but in Oman as well, you find these sand dunes that have reintroduced populations of the Arabian oryx, a uh, very large type of gazelle that uh, came very close to extinction and has now been reintroduced in a number of, um, of desert uh, reserves. A uh, beautiful animal, but unfortunately very difficult to see, but in some areas in Oman, uh, possible. So, yeah, once you've driven through a stretch of desert like that and you've encountered a few of the different uh, of the different types and birds you start to become quite familiar with them um, and then you realize that in the north those really dry mountains even though technically a type of desert themselves um, they do host a number of different species they're especially important for as a wintering ground for a number of uh, large birds of prey um, including uh, the Egyptian vulture, quite an endangered species, uh, a migratory vulture that will travel down from Central Asia and winter in pretty large numbers. Uh, quite often, you will find big con congregations of them near big landfills or, or dumps, uh, which allow for really good looks. Of course, you have to take the smell as well, but um, at least you get a really good uh, chance to uh, study these these birds. The same goes for the steppe eagle. Uh, again, a pretty endangered ground breeder from the, the steppes of Kazakhstan and Mongolia that winters in the Horn of, the Horn of Africa, but also now uh, more, more increasingly farther north uh, because uh, the landfills make food so easily available for them. Here's a juvenile bird with the typical white uh, coverts on the underwing. And then of course, um, I'm not sure what this bird was doing with its legs, but uh, this is an uh, imperial eagle. Again, another typical steppe breeder that uh, is quite rare, uh, eastern imperial eagle, but allows for some great study once you're in the, the correct habitat. Those mountains in the north, they also are, how do you say that, inter interlarded with these big uh, canyons or wadis. Um, the same goes for certain uh, mountains in the far south. Um, this is the habitat of the famous uh, Omani owl, which was only discovered uh, a few years ago. Um, it's a really difficult species to find. I don't have any photos of it, uh, even though I, I, did, I did get it after four days of searching last year. Um, for nights, that is. Um, but it's relative, the, the desert tawny owl uh, is pretty common in the far south um, and looks like this. So the Omani owl it looks very similar, but it's darker, more chocolatey brown. And it's these canyons that 
usually have a bit of an of a uh, subterranean uh, riverbed, and so there is some water and some acacias growing that allow for other owls as well, such as this pellet scops owl, to um, to survive. Um, same goes for the far bigger faro eagle owl, another another typical bird from this kind of habitat. And then even though there's only a few acacias usually in those super dry wadis um, in the very early mornings, right before the heat of the day hits, they are great places to look for uh, for migrants. And one very drab, uh, non-assuming bird, the plain leaf warbler, is actually quite a difficult bird to connect with in the rest of the world, um, breeding in the high mountains of Iran and uh, wintering in Oman. Uh, but this small, um, yeah, acacia dweller is uh, can can be easily found, especially in the north of the country. Of course, if you keep uh, following those mountains up, eventually you end up on some pretty high plateaus. Uh, these are the the northern plateaus, so the northern mountains, which are a lot drier than the the, the Afrotropical plateaus in the south, which we will discuss later. Um, but even with this very dry uh, vegetation, it's still possible to find uh, migrants. Um, some typical birds from this habitat are the black-throated thrush from, um, from East Asia that you can find there, uh, among some other uh, local buntings, such as a striolated bunting um, and stuff like that. Um, so even though those mountains are only accessible in a few places, uh, they provide for some great birding where you can easily spend one or two days before you continue um, south. And so heading south, you will soon end up uh, near the mangroves. Um, it's either in the far north or in the east of Oman that you will eventually be able to visit these. Um, Mangroves, as I said earlier, are a very endangered uh, type of vegetation. And especially in Oman and the nearby UAE, it hosts a very critically endangered bird, the Arabian colored kingfisher. Uh, there's not many of these left, but they're still hanging on. Um, the nominate, while well, the nominate, there's many different subspecies of this kingfisher. Many are doing pretty well in the more tropical areas. Um, around the Indian Ocean, but the Arabian colored kingfisher is definitely not on a, on a great trajectory. More common visitors for these mangroves are uh, greater flamingo, and then very important, um, the mangroves are the main wintering site for uh, blue-cheeked bee-eater, uh, a species from mainly Central Asia, but also Northwestern Africa. Uh, as soon as you hit the mangroves, you can hear their raspy uh, flight calls. Uh, very beautiful birds. Next, we have the quars. So quite often, flanking those mangrove forests are um, these brackish or sometimes freshwater lagoons. They're, they're quite often like small outflows. What they actually are is just water that comes from the mountains and more or less runs underneath the surface of the of the ground and eventually comes up right before it uh, enters the ocean. In especially the far south, where there is a bit more moisture and uh, precipitation, um, you, you find more of these. And so quite often they're surrounded by the city or by uh, agricultural land. So birds are not only steered towards them thanks to the dry surroundings, but also because there is usually too much disturbance in the nearby area so that birds have to go down in this kind of habitat, which makes from them for great uh, birding sites because as soon as you go there, you find a lot of birds. There are even some resident breeding birds that are very rare anywhere else in Arabia, such as this yellow bittern, which only occurs in a few of those quars in the far south of the country. Um, but generally, these quars really allow for great and easy birding um, and good looks at things like egrets, great egrets. Um, they're also the, fav the favorite wintering destination of uh, some more rare birds of prey, such as the greater spotted eagle, 
a fairly uh, endangered uh, marsh eagle from Siberia that will winter in these habitats and look for prey there. And of course, vagrants. Oman is known for its weird vagrants showing up. Uh, visiting birders quite often come home with some exciting new discoveries, birds from either the Indian subcontinent or farther east or, or the Horn of Africa. Last year, this African open bill was a big star bird that many birders connected with um, that was visiting a car like that. Uh, but maybe that seems to be maybe uh, quite expected because it occurs fairly close in, in Kenya, for example. But then more bizarre was this buff-breasted sandpiper species that we're all familiar with in Victoria, um, a buff-breasted sandpiper that hang out there. Um, and then on our trip, we found a, an oriental pretinkol as well, uh, a species from Southeast Asia that was had been blown in by the by the wind. So birding those quars always is exciting. Quite often you don't really see that much different than the, the, the previous quar, but then every once in a while there is something that just really is unexpected. Of course, the beaches and shores. The beaches are pretty, pretty beautiful at times there. Um, and they allow for a great study of, well, one of my favorite groups of birds, the seagulls. Yes, I said it. Um, so the Sudi gull, uh, here's a juvenile, is a very common uh, species uh, on the coast of Oman, but actually quite a uh, almost Arabian endemic, although it does winter south to uh, Tanzania. Um, but uh, yeah, quite a rare bird uh, to see well. And yeah, they really allow for some great studying on the beaches in Oman. Same goes for more common or more widespread species like a greater crested tern that breeds nearby. You can see a juvenile here. And of course, for the gull lovers, there is the endless soup. Uh, maybe like there I say that it is a soup that is almost uh, the same level as we get to enjoy here in Victoria. Um, the big steppe gull slash Caspian gull uh, slash, slash Huglin's gull mishmash from Siberia. So uh, many of these birds here are, yeah, not really known. It's not really known what they exactly are. There's many intergrades. You have birds, gulls that, that breed on the warm steppes of southern Kazakhstan. So they barely, they don't really fly a, a very long distance. But then at the same time, you have the gulls from the high Arctic, uh, central or, or eastern Siberia that winter here. So definitely always an adventure. Um, and then, of course, yeah, the mudflats. Um, Oman is world renowned for its gigantic shorebird wintering area. Uh, the famous mudflats of Bar al Hikman in the east of the country are, yeah, are just, uh, are really world famous. Um, they, they are important wintering site for many, many rare shorebirds uh, breeding in west, central, but even northeastern Siberia. Um, you can find a very high diversity here. Um, even local breeding species, such as the beautiful crab plover breed here. Um, but it's especially the wintering part that's so important. Um, birds of note, besides the usual Tarek sandpiper or broadbill sandpiper, are the very rare great knot that has one of its most Western regular wintering sites here. Um, but uh, also other species that are um, less or considered more common, such as uh, two different types of the lesser sand plover, uh, among many other species. So uh, yeah, here's a massive flock of uh, bar-tailed godwits and some greater flamingos and um, gray herons, as well as some reef herons as well in the front here. Um, yeah, the bar-tailed godwit, uh, quite rare in Victoria but uh, we, I think we get one every year almost on the island. But uh, yeah, it's main wintering sites, especially for the Western subspecies and the central uh, Siberian subspecies are in Oman. And then of course there's the bizarre and unique looking uh, crab plover 
that is uh, that breeds locally there. Uh, fairly easy to see, but not so easy to approach. Uh, they quite, they're quite common though, so um, quite easy to eventually find. Um, and then of course, smaller birds such as here, this broad-billed sandpiper are easily studied on the mudflats. I have to say that I had to work hard to get some closer views of these birds because we are, of course, still in, yeah, a part of the world where maybe not so much in Oman, but in other parts on the trajectory of or the migratory pathway of these birds, they're heavily hunted. So you can definitely notice that they're less, uh, less easily approached uh, like they would be here. So that's, of course, uh, a bit of a, of a shame, but uh, if you try a bit... Uh, long enough then eventually you get some good looks and so usually those mudflats you encounter at the far east of Oman so that means if you do the traditional uh, route that I'll discuss later um, you're already halfway south but if you then continue towards the town of the or the city of Salala you eventually end up in the most interesting habitat which are the Afrotropical forests of the Dofar mountains so as you can see, as you can see, it can be pretty lush, especially in the more sheltered uh, canyons. Um, if you look at the city of Salala, there really is this green belt around it. Uh, this is a whole mountain range that is predominantly fed by fog uh, coming off the ocean, as well as big typhoons that hit during uh, the northern summer. Um, so during the winter time, when usually is uh, when people start going, uh, it's fairly quiet there. The weather is usually pretty mild, uh, 25 to 30 degrees, uh, dry, continuous sun. Um, but so anyway, this uh, this basically creates or forms an extension of the more typical habitats you find in countries like Ethiopia or other higher parts of the Horn of Africa. And of course, that brings with it different um, different birds that are that you can't really find anywhere else in in Oman, uh, such such as this shining sunbird, but also more or animals that you associate with the tropics more, such as this big uh, nephila spider, um, and even more striking uh, animals such as the Arabian chameleon, which can be quite common in the right habitat. Um, in the birds or what the birds, uh, there's, there's quite a few bird species that are completely unique from there. It starts with smaller species like this Namakwa dove, uh, that indicate a more African influence. Um, the Arabian eagle owl, um, yeah, also occurs just there. And same goes for the Arabian scops owl, uh, both specialists from pretty dense forests, uh, which you don't find that much in the rest of Arabia. Of course, there's the beautiful Bonelli's eagle, which is a pretty widespread raptor, but you can get some really good looks off, especially in the south of Oman. And then maybe one of the most striking African representatives uh, is the African paradise flycatcher, um, which has a very bizarre a range and just makes it there uh, as a bit of a relict population in those lush mountains. They also have one species of green pigeon, the Bruce's green pigeon, which unfortunately I didn't get a photo of. And so if you then climb the Dofar mountains higher up, uh, eventually you um, you leave those uh, forested canyons and you end up in this kind of high elevated plateau, uh, which becomes a bit drier again, because you're, of course, uh, more exposed to the sun. Uh, but every birder, it's one of every birder's famous or, well, most uh, wanted trips to do when you're in Salalah, because it's the only place to see the very majestic Veroxus eagle. This bird is quite a specialist and hunts for rock hyraxes, which are... Um, yeah, these mammals that look a bit like marmots, but if, but I I I seem to recall that they're more related to elephants. But yeah, they look like small weird marmots, um, and they're this guy's favorite meal. So quite often you see them 
doing all these acrobatic uh, flights along the cliffs to try and drag one into the depth. Another bird that's quite common on this high plateau is the Abdim's stork. Again, another species that's mostly shared with uh, northeastern Africa. So yeah, there's a lot to do there, but we've forgotten one important uh, habitat, of course. And if you look at the map, it's pretty clear which one it is. Uh, that's, of course, the ocean. Um, now, there's many parts uh, around Oman where the ocean is fairly deep, the Indian Ocean. However, uh, especially in the far south, close to the town of Mirbat, uh, the, the, the depth or the very deep uh, waters come really close to the, to the shore, which allow for uh, good pelagic conditions, because obviously you want to always find the deeper waters because there is more upwelling from uh, nutrients, and so more birds to be expected. Persian shearwater, quite a common species uh, to be seen on this pelagic. And very funny, um, flesh-footed shearwater as well, the species that we annually get on the pelagics in BC as well. So just to show how these birds really travel the world. Um, at the same time, off Mirbat uh, is one of the best places in the world to see the masked uh, booby, very striking species. And up to four different species of dolphin can be observed here as well. Uh, it can be pretty crazy there. Uh, there's some extras, uh, including bridled and sooty terns. Uh, there's even white cheek terns. Um, yeah, any trip there is quite uh, memorable and often has a good mix of both uh, cetaceans as well as good birds. Um, of course, these are all more or less the natural habitats that we discussed. Um, but of course, birding in Oman comes with a lot of birding in artificial habitats as well. Well, it depends how much you want to include of it because it won't really deliver the local specialties in terms of the local, or not, not so readily uh, produce the local endemics or anything. Uh, but it's really good for migrants. If you put a golf course like this in a completely deserted, dry area, then obviously migrant birds are going to touch down. Um, many wagtails, many pipits, larks, um, warblers in those little trees or in the little artificial ponds they make. Uh, these places can be really exciting. Um, a common species is the Indian roller which is not a migrant, but uh, that's kind of a typical bird from this uh, half natural, uh, well, no, not really half, it's just completely artificial nature, um, can be easily found flying around there. And then another beautiful bird is the Arabian green bee eater. This is actually a local specialty, but it has managed to really adopt the or adapt to uh, humans and their, their construction or their, their, their lifestyle. Uh, and so it's it's now easily found in any type or near humans. Um, but again, also migrants uh, can show up. Um, for example, here's a citrine wagtail, quite a common common migrant in uh, anywhere where you find water in Oman. And then there's even these um, date palm groves that can look from a distance as a complete dead zone. But, but then as soon as you start walking around there, you notice little birds that are hiding even in the middle of the day, uh, which can be interesting. Some birds are can be pretty confiding, like for example, this uh, southern gray shrike that I photographed. Uh, well, as you can see from pretty close by, it wasn't too scared. Um, this is just in an agricultural, uh, I'm not sure what they were planting here, but uh, some one of those circular fields which are constantly irrigated. Um, so yeah, it really allowed for some close views. And then even at night, uh, when you have, when, for example, around the pool, suddenly this, uh, yeah, this spot of technique uh, showed up and is, uh, yeah, it's just really unexpected, but there you go, right away, uh, another of the local uh, specialties. Uh, and yeah. Just really exciting to always have a chance to uh, look for birds there, even when you're uh, when you're basically laying by the pool. 
so that was kind of in a nutshell some of the birds of Oman and their habitats. Now you might want to you might wonder how to travel this country actually. Um, yeah, of course you can go with a tour company, but uh, how to do it independently is actually fairly easy. Uh, you just need to make sure to rent a vehicle, preferably four by four. I've done it in both four by four as well as uh, some strange sports type vehicle that they or that my friend rented, uh, which was a bit problematic, but we also survived with that one. I'm not sure how long the car will survive now after we drove with it, but at least it survived the trip. So preferably you will get a four by four, uh, such as, for example, a Pajero uh, or stuff like that. You just need to apply for an electronic visa, which goes very smooth, smoothly. Uh, I recently applied a few days ago and I got it before I had even closed off the uh, my tabs. Uh, so it was already processed that quickly. And then you're good to go. Now, in terms of food, uh, as I said earlier, it's predominantly South Asian, so Indian or Bengali. And there is, of course, lots of fast food available, especially in the north. And accommodation uh, is usually pretty comfortable to even luxurious. So, uh, as I said, it's a high income country um, that doesn't that is not necessarily always reflected in the public infrastructure, like at the roads or anything. Um, for example, here you can see that the roads, yeah, sometimes you kind of have to do it with this. Uh, but it's all in a great state. There's no weird potholes or anything. It's all working smoothly and, and pretty well. Uh, so, yeah, really easy country. I can highly recommend it. Um, so what is the general way that people travel Oman? So most people will, of course, land in Muscat. Uh, you have flights from Istanbul or... Uh, India as well. Um, I think from Vancouver, the fastest way would be to fly to Istanbul and then from Istanbul to Muscat. Um, usually people then travel a bit along the coast as well as through the Al Hajar mountains before they cross the desert and end up at um, the famous mud flats of Bar al Hikmam. Then the road leads you through even more desert. Uh, that this the second the second part here is a drive that you can do in one long afternoon. So it's it's not a the whole drive from Muscat to Salalah in the south is about nine hours. So on a few days it's perfectly doable. And there's some burning destinations along the way, and eventually you end up in Salalah in the Dofar Mountains. And then usually people return the vehicle there and fly back to Muscat. Uh, from where, um, yeah, from where they leave again. So that is, in a nutshell, how you travel Oman. Um, I'd like to end with a few more photos, uh, just to show some more birds uh, of this area. Um, here, for example, uh, this is a, the only record shot I got of a honey badger, uh, a, sp a species that you would assume to be more Indian or uh, African, but also occurs in Oman. Uh, Oman is a great place to study uh, sea turtles as well. Green sea turtle here. Um, here's a bit more of an atmospherical photo of my uh, co-leader Johannes looking over the uh, mangroves. The short-toed snake eagle. A very common migrant, but always quite an impressive bird to see. And during last year's tour, we witnessed how um, the Veroxus eagle brutally attacked a young Eastern Imperial eagle, and they both fell down to the ground. We never really found out what happened to them. Um, I assume they, they uh, detached right before impact. Um, this is a photo of one of the steppe eagles on the fence of uh, one of the famous dumps in uh, near Salalah. So great place to study raptors um, from very close. Quite often you can see three or four hundred of these eagles. Of course, we we know a bit, we know a fair bit about eagles in BC as well. But to see three or four different species uh, mixed together, steppe eagle, of course, the majority, but then also greater or even lesser spotted eagle. Um, and then some vultures is always quite impressive. And then, of course, one of the last highlights was finding this sociable lapwing, uh, critically endangered shorebird that uh, breeds in Central Asia and 
winters in uh, on some of the ag the artificial agricultural fields in Oman. Uh, here's a young bird. Okay, that was in short the how to bird Oman. Um, I really want to thank you all for uh, listening. And uh, again, here is my email address as well as my uh, link tree. And I'm very happy to answer any questions if you have them. That was awesome, Joachim. Um, there is one question. What month were you there? I was there last year uh, from the 28th of October till the uh, 12th of November. And then I did one extra week with a friend who visited. So until the 20th of November. And now I'm leaving again on the 3rd of November until the 20, um, till the 18th, I believe. Yeah, 18th. So is in November is a, is a great time because you have still, there's still some migration going on. Um, it's also a bit more exciting because usually that's the time when people start going. People really go there during the winter. That's the main season, November till February. Um, and if you go later in the winter, then there's usually some staked out rarities, which are yeah, fun to see. But it's more exciting in November because you don't really know yet what is there. And it's one of these countries where you just bump into unexpected stuff all the time. Uh, it happened many times last uh, tour. Um, so November, I think, is a really great month. Oh, and actually important, I have not shown this bird, but... Um, Oman is one of the places where you can see the Sudi falcon. That is a, a, a species of falcon. Oh, I don't have a photo of that one in here, unfortunately. But that is a completely gray falcon with yellow uh, sear around the bill. Um, that is fairly difficult to see as they breed on these little islands, or well, little islets off the coast of Arabia. Um, and winter on Madagascar. They fly straight across the ocean to Madagascar from there. So, but Oman is a good place to see them because especially around the capital, you have some small islands that you can easily charter a small uh, vessel to. Um, but the problem is that those birds are very strict. Like they usually leave around the 10th of November. Um, and at the same time, uh, for many people, the hypocolius, um, the waxwing relative I showed earlier, can pull it up again. Oh no, I stopped share. Oh no, I'm still sharing. Still um, sharing. The hypo the hypocolius only arrives uh, at the yeah also the first or second week of November. So to have a chance for both species, you really want to try and go in November. Oh, yeah, here's the hypocolius. Uh, there's lots of people talking about how fantastic your photos are and and how great the presentation was. Uh, a couple more questions. What is the best field guide for Oman? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, personally, okay, there is the Helm field guides. I, unfortunately, I don't have him with me here because he is at my parents' home in Belgium. Um, there is the Helm field guides, birds of the Middle East. The only problem is that is a bit outdated at this point. The, the drawings are not super good anymore. So what I personally really like is simply using the Collins, the, 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 the European bird guide, uh, which will cover about 75% of all the species. And then in combination with the Merlin package, you will have basically all you need. Um, of course, the, the Helm field guides one will be nice, yeah, of course, to have a physical copy to go through. Um, it's just that the drawings are not, yeah, they're a bit, uh, let's say that the region is due for a newer, newer field guide for sure. And also many of these subspecies that were poorly described in the nineties and early two thousands are now better studied. And so I think that a review of that, um, of that guide would be, uh, would be welcome. So how, how is the Mer Merlin bird pack for that area? Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Um, it's it has it's quite complete. I don't recall having too many issues. Um, recently, I was in Southeast Asia, and there were way more issues with it. There, it was quite incomplete for many regions, missing sounds or even missing range maps. That's not so much of a problem for the the 
the Middle East pack of, of Merlin. It's, it's quite decent. Um, I have a question about your spider photo. Was was that a male up on top of the female? I think so. Yes. Uh, where is it? Yeah, I think the male is sitting here. Just behind. the female is the, the large one, and then the male is just hiding behind here. Yeah. Amazing photos, and and many many people have been saying that. I think a few people are are checking Expedia right now to see what it <laughs> costs to go. Um, <laughs> So we're very grateful for you having done this presentation for us, Joachim. Thank you so much. And we're looking forward to hearing more about some of your other travels as well. Perfect. Yes, I'm, I, uh, I look forward. And uh, last time, in case anyone has a question, feel free to uh, give me a, uh, yeah, just write me or, or contact me. Um, yeah. And I'm looking forward to uh, meet you all in the field again. And if you have if you've persuaded some people here to go on a tour with you, where should they be looking for your your trips that you're leading? Uh, oh, here on the link tree, actually, you can find the uh, you can find some of my uh, 2024 ones. Uh, I have some in Canada. I have one to Mongolia as well, uh, which is an exciting destination with many similar birds, actually, to Oman. Um, so you can find it there, or just speak talk to me in the field whenever you run into me. Uh, I'm always happy to share information. Okay. Well, thank you again. And thanks everyone for coming and we will see you at future presentations. Perfect, look forward. Bye everyone. Bye. -bye.